Hello everyone, it's me, Michelle Daniels, your e-facilitator. I'm an educator, speaker, a digital content designer, and most of all, I'm a woman of God. I want to thank you for coming on tonight for e-Bible study. Hello, Facebook Live. Hello, Twitter. Hello, YouTube. Thank you for joining me on tonight. If you would, please type in your name and the city that you are watching from, because I would like to connect with you. All right, we're going to give people a few minutes to come on. Again, please type in your name and the city that you are watching from. I want to thank those of you who uh, donated and got the ebook. I appreciate it you I appreciate you I appreciate you it is loaded with a lot of good information um, it's not just my teaching notes it's everything that I have gathered on witchcraft and it makes excellent teaching material um, for those of you who would like to do a class of your own Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. We are in the book of Acts, chapter number 8, verses 9 through 24. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 9 through 24. So, last week we talked about mediums, and this week we're going to talk about sorcerers. And, yes, one is apples, and the other is orange. Um, oranges, but nonetheless, uh, they're all in the same family. They're all fruit, <laughs> okay? And so um, we're still under the topic of witchcraft, but we're kind of breaking it down into different groups. So in the book of Acts, chapter 8, starting with verse uh, 9 through 24, um, Philip the Evangelist is healing people and preaching the gospel in the city of Samaria. Uh, we are now introduced to a man named Simon. He is a new magician and he's famous. He's the rich and the famous among the Samaritans. Um, the people of Samaria, Samaria have drifted away from Judaism and they're only teaching from the first five books of the Bible, which is under the ones that Moses uh, created. And, and they're using that as the God's word. They're ignoring the rest of the Old Testament. Their beliefs have now become heretic and they're misguided to the point that eventually they honor a sorcerer as being sent by God. The book of Deuteronomy is one of the books that supposedly they reverenced um, but it teaches harshly against sorcery in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 13. But for whatever reason, um, they have been beguiled, tricked, deceived by Simon. Um, the Bible is clear that magical practice is not sent from God. Uh, the king of Manasseh of Judah committed terrible acts of evil by uh, practicing magic and he even made his own sons um, to uh, walk through fire in the valley of ben Hinnom. Uh, he practiced witchcraft, divination, sorcery. He dealt with mediums and spiritualism. And basically, um, we see here that Simon is indulged in the very same things. Now... He did so much evil in the sight of the Lord. We're talking back about King Manasseh. Uh, he did so much evil in the sight of the Lord that he provoked God to anger. In Second Chronicles 33, verse 6, sorcery is also mentioned as one of the deeds of the flesh, that it prevents those who practice it from inheriting the kingdom of God. Now, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, every Samaritan, all, from the smallest to the greatest, were given attention 
to him, Simon, from the beggars in the street to the very wealthy, from children and even the elders, everyone reverend Simon for his great acts. Um, and he was, he even called himself um, the great one. <laughs> wow, wow. So, um, now there was a big difference between some, the city of Samaria and Jerusalem. They were in great contrast. Despite her rebellion and unbelief, Jerusalem was not affiliated with superstition and they did not adhere to any sorcery. Um, this is found in John 4, verse 22. Um, now in ignorant religions, superstition and magic tend to prevail. But where the truth is known, even if it is not obeyed, it tends to drive these things back into the shadows. Hence, the verses show that um, spiritual darkness in Samaria was <laughs> off the hook. And the dissolution knew no bounds of class or status from the least to the greatest. It had proven itself to be enduring and lasted for a very long time. Now, in the book of Acts, verses 12 through 13, um, here we see, we're still in chapter 8, here we see most striking the liberating power of the gospel. The kingdom of God was used uh, and taught from, and the name of Jesus Christ is mightier than the kingdom of darkness or any earthly name, and in this case, Simon's. Um, when they believed, as Philip preached, the things concerning God and in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women became baptized. Baptism was a decisive step for these Samaritans um, in renouncing their former superstitions and linking them to their past. Moreover, only were, not only were the deceived liberated, but so was the deceiver himself, Simon. He believed. His experience with the truth of God was no different from the others, for he too believed and was baptized. So we need to understand that there's no special conditions for even the worst sinners who are under satanic tools, blaspheme, it doesn't matter if they're like Simon, and they too can be saved. In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, these verses complete the picture, bringing the sharpest contrast that, of the present state of, of the Samaritans with their former one. Whereas Simon is imagined that they found the great power of God, now they know that the Holy Spirit has, uh, has come and they have really found the true power of God. And whereas they had given heed to Simon's deceit, now they possess the one of, of one to whom by giving heed they could be taught the things of truth. Found in first John chapter twenty two in first John chapter two verse twenty seven. The Christians find true deliverance from both satanic power and delusion by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. The unusual method by which the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands by the apostles prevented schism and rivalry at the very first. Samaritans religious rejected the claims of Jerusalem, but by receiving the Holy Spirit through the hands of the Jewish apostles, the Samaritans conversions are now made uh, to have them indebted to it. The Jews despised the Samaritans, yet here they both laid hands on and prayed for them. So why is this a big deal? Why is it a big deal that the Jews and the Samaritans were feuding? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. 
So we see in John chapter 4, verse 9, that uh, he addresses this question. Uh, why did the Jews had no dwell dealing with the Samaritans? The Jews had an ongoing feud with the Samaritans from the time they returned from Babylon's captivity. This is called the Samaritan Schism. When King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was conquering the Middle East world, he used tactics designed to keep the captives from uniting and rebelling against him. He played a kind of fruit basket turnover uh, by moving large populations of countries to different locations. So when he took most of, the, of Judah to Babylon, he resettled other people in their place. Now all the Jews were not carried off. The elderly and the sick were left behind and many temple scribes were left to care for them. With the country almost vac vacant, the scribes and the other able-bodied people moved into the plantations on the rolling pasture lands of Samaria. They intermarried with those who had been brought in so that the Samaritans were no longer considered a pure Jewish race. Babylon and the Samaritans came to help to rebuild Jerusalem. The Jews called them half-breeds and sent them back to their homes. So the Samaritans built their own temple, which the Jews considered to be a pagan temple. Um, the feud grew, and by the time of Christ, the Jews hated the Samaritans so much so that they would cross the Jordan River rather than to travel through Samaria. But in John 4 and 4 says, Jesus had to go through Samarita, Samaria. Why? Because he had a divine appointment with a woman there who later said she believed when the Messiah came, he would teach her all about God. Later, to shame the Jews for their prejudice, Jesus made the main character of one of his parables a good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And one leopard of the 10 in Luke 17 who returned to thank Jesus was a Samaritan. So on a side note, the scribes later became so wealthy that they hired servants to copy the scrolls. They became the lawyers who interpreted the law of Moses and they gave Jesus much opposition. So this is why they always feuded. This is why they did not get along. And that's why Jesus had to go to Samaria, to Samaria uh, because he had to reunite the Jews. Um, and this whole mentality about them being half breed um, because Jesus came for everyone. Now, it's, it's good to note that the Spirit had been given to the Samaritans. If, if, the, if the Spirit of God had been given to the Samaritans exactly as it had in Jerusalem, this fact might have been distorted to prove that the Samaritans' error of downgrading the place God had put his name. But due to the wisdom of God, it, it, it prevented all of this. And the Holy Spirit brought salvation and unity. Typically, we might suggest that Simon is a prefigure of the man of sin, who is likewise will claim to be someone very great, found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, which supports his claims by miracles in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 9 and in Revelation chapter 13, and will be an object of wonder and aberration of the world. As the ignorant worshipers of Samaria, in John chapter four, verse 22, begot, Salmon, begot Simon, so the ignorant provisions of Christian's truth by the world will be ultimately produced the man of sin in the last days and how many of you know that so he he's already been born we don't know what age he is but he is he's he's in development and it won't be long that he'll be bursting on the scene 
So praise God. Hopefully we will be gone in the, the rapture. We won't be here to see it. But those who are left behind are going to see the man of sin. So in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 and 19, Simon is truly saved. It does not give Simon's words, but the words of Luke under the Holy Spirit's guidance, Simon himself also believed. That's what it says. Yes, he was a new believer. And like many other new believers do, Simon brings his into his Christian life the erroneous outlook of his past. You see, we are saved through repentance and belief. But transform, transformation does, it happens in a process. So let me say that again. We're saved through repentance and belief. But you have to first believe. When you hear the gospel, you have to believe that it is the word of God. You have to first believe. Then you repent. Make confession with your mouth. We always say, make confession with your mouth and believe in your heart. You have to believe in your heart that the words that you heard are the gospel. That they're the words of God. You have to first believe. Then you can confess your sins and be saved. Okay? And so, in order to transform, to change, your mind has to be renewed by the word of God. And that takes time. It's you're born again, so you, you it's it's a new birth. You don't know the things of God. You have to learn the things of God, and so that takes time. So in our story, Simon offers them money. Doubtless, that in the past money could have secured an experience of Simon's powers. So he naturally thought he could also secure God's powers. In Acts chapter 8, verses 20 through 23, Peter tells him, your money perishes with you. Peter gives him a sharp rebuke at this offer, and it was designed to bring Simon to repentance, and it did. These words made him apply to these words may also apply to any Christian whose heart places an undue emphasis on the value of money. So now let's get the one thing straight. We live in a system that requires us to have money. Okay? And so we can't live without money. We just can't. We must have money to survive. To buy things, food necessities, and of course to have the nicer things in life. But our emphasis should not be on money alone. We know that we that are believers know that God is our source. We know that that we can utilize money and be blessings and bless others with our money as well as our time and our treasure and our talent. But it shouldn't be money first. It should be God first. And so this is the point that Peter is trying to get across to Simon. And Simon understands the rebuke and receives it. So here in our scripture, perish does not mean going to hell in Acts 25 verse 16. It means to be put to ruin. It merely warns of the ruin of life and the soul which with such an attitude could bring. In Luke chapter 6, verse 49 as well, Peter actually wishes the destruction of the money, thus highlighting his attitude towards it. This was a warning to Simon as what he would be heading for. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. The elevation of money in your heart makes it crooked before God and shuts the soul out from or taken apart from eternal things which God counts. And the verse should read, For I see you being destined to the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. The heart is influenced by money, will ultimately taste the gall of sorrow, 
and disappointment which it can bring found in first timothy chapter 6 verses 9 through 12. so it's talking about how money can poison you in acts chapter 8 verse 23 the love of money is poison for the soul the heart who strives after money's influence and also can easily get caught up in the bond of sin entanglement enslaved by the wickedness which accompanies money seeking repentance in acts 8 chapter 24 pray for the lord for me simon quickly repents with a sign of a tender conscience becomes because he becomes aware of this corrupt practice simon has been easily regarded and understands that he must give up evil yet men thus have testified to the blindness of money but it takes divine grace for you to see that you have to change your ways so even it is even possible that contrary to tradition the remind this is to remind us of simon's life was it and it did become fruitful for if peter prayed for him it is it is truly likely that god answered that prayer because we don't see anything saying otherwise that after that simon went back to his old ways now there are three references that are found in context to prayer simon had missed the fact that prayer laid hand, laid behind the giving of the spirit he saw only the external laying on of hands so you know he didn't understand that the uh, that peter and philip had a prayer life they prayed before they got to samaria uh, they prayed for people's salvation. They prayed for what they should say uh, to the people. All they saw was them laying on hands and people got saved. People got baptized. And so he didn't understand the spiritual things. And so money has a way of blinding one in a prayer, from their prayer life because they don't pray they just going after money while the heart is controlled when the heart is controlled by prayer it blinds us to money so like i said we know that we need money that's part of the system that we live in but that should not be our focal point men usually feel that money can can obtain most of what they want or need as simon had did in the past the man of God realizes that prayer alone can obtain what is really needed and what is worthwhile. Simon is brought to the realization of money in comparison to the things of God. And that the money, uh, that the spiritual things have to transcend um, what, it, what money can only buy. That spiritual things are important to the soul. And he begins to seek to buy the power of God but then at the end of the story he realizes that he needs prayer so he understands the reality of prayer in his life so this is what all I have on sorcery for tonight um, please go back and read Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24 for yourself. Um, like I said, mediums and sorcery, they go hand in hand because they're, they all fall under witchcraft. Mediums believe in that they are speaking to the dead, where sorcery encounters uh, many other things. But Simon was involved with everything. And so he did terrible acts as well as being able to speak um you know for the dead and, and that kind of stuff to impress people he did everything because he was money hungry and money driven so i want to pray tonight um and i didn't do it last week because i 
I thought I was going to be able to talk about both subjects at the same time, but I want to always hold to my 30 minute timetable uh, because I know that your time is precious and usually running class longer than that, you don't obtain it anyhow. So let me start this prayer with saying that the high places of witchcraft be destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the high places be purged through your anointing. Let the familiar spirits, wizards, and idols be taken out of the land. I rebuke and destroy every wicked cauldron in the name of Jesus. I rebuke and destroy every seating pot or cauldron stirred up by the enemy against my life and the believer's life in our cities and in our nation. Let every wicked cauldron in the city be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. I break every witchcraft cauldron stirred up by witches, warlocks in the name of Jesus. Lord, visit every witch, every warlock in my region and convict them. Let them repent. Let them turn to you and be saved. Uh, I'm delivered from the boiling pot in the name of Jesus, Lord. Bring me out of the midst of every cauldron. The enemy will not eat my flesh, break my bones, or put me in his cauldron. Lord, deliver and protect me from every pot of evil in the name of Jesus. Lord, deliver me from the boiling pot of pride in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, if there's anyone listening who has participated in witchcraft, who has went and seeked out a medium uh, because they have lost loved ones and they're not sure uh, where they are and what's going on with them, let them now repent in the mighty name of Jesus. Let them know that this is not of God, that these are evil spirits and let them know that you are the true and the living God and that there is no other God but you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the teaching on tonight. We pray that it is a blessing in someone's life. Should you have any questions or any concerns or if you, would, if you have prayer requests, please go to my website, your e-facilitator.com. That's your e hyphen facilitator.com scroll down to the bottom of the page leave your name your your email and your prayer requests or your questions and i will gladly answer them for you uh, i want to pray with you and for you because we serve a prayer answering god uh, join me on next week as we continue on in the word of god regarding uh, these great topics um, you can re-watch the replay. Again, when you're watching, put in your name and the city that you're watching from. Please like and share this video with your friends, your family, your mom and them, so we can get more people on and watching. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. You can go there, um, Michelle A. Daniels, and you can t and watch the videos there as well and share them likewise. I want to speak blessings and peace on you tonight. I want to thank you for uh, watching this video. Again, please share it and like it so that we can get more people watching. I want to speak blessings and peace to you. Good night.